Right, good morning everybody. I think we'll get, we'll get started. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we gather and meet and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, I'm Neville Flint, I'm the Director of the Sustainable Minerals Institute and I'm delighted to welcome you all to this morning's panel. I'd particularly like to welcome our panellists, our four panellists, um, Tony Hodge, Anna Littleboy, Sarah Holcomb and Anthony Kelly, who will be formally introduced shortly. For those who aren't familiar with the Institute, um, we're a world-leading research um, organisation dedicated to finding knowledge-based solutions to the sustainability challenges of the minerals industry, training the next generation of leaders and developing effective partnerships with industry. We integrate the expertise of technical, environmental and social specialists to deliver responsible resource development. Across the life of mine, we are independent, objective and rigorous in our research. The Sustainable Minerals Institute is home to a centre of excellence in Chile and six research centres including the Centre of Social Responsibility Mining who are hosting today's event. So to the centre, thank you very much for hosting today. Our work covers all facets of life of mine, from geology to minerals extraction, water management, mineral processing, workplace health and safety, mine rehabilitation, energy and community engagement. And it is community and the impact of mining on people and place that we are discussing today. The mining industry is, is reaching a crossroads and there's recognition that it can't continue to operate the way it has in the past. And it needs to come to terms with the range of complexities facing the mon modern mineral projects and development, develop tools to address the challenges that are locking up future mining supply. Those challenges will be met by multidisciplinary teams and social scientists are absolutely vital to the success of those teams in securing a future where the communities and the demand for responsibility and transparency from mining companies are prioritised. We are fortunate today to have the support of one of our partners, Oceana Gold, who are kindly paying for lunch for everyone. And, and I'd like to introduce their Executive Vice President, and Head of External Affairs and Social Performance, Sharon Flynn. Sharon has a long history of working with the Centre for Responsibility in Mining and is someone who is committed to continuing professional development in this area. Sharon, thank you. Good morning. Thank you for coming. Oceana Gold is very pleased to be supporting the Sustainable Minerals Institute and the Center for Social Responsibility in Mining for this important panel discussion on social sciences and mining. Um, mining needs social science and social scientists, and that's not just the large-scale corporate mining, the type of mining that I work in and the type of mining that I think some of you all work in. NGOs donor agencies who are working in artisanal and small-scale mining, which employs actually tens of millions more people around the world than large-scale mining does, needs social science to understand complexity. Governments that are trying to craft policy solutions in complex contexts for both artisanal, small-scale, and large-scale mining need the information and expertise that social science can bring. It's absolutely critical. And there's no limit to the challenges that mining writ broadly can present to us as society, as governments, and as business. I met um, a gentleman in February this year in Canada at the PDAC conference, who's the Minister of Mines for Mali. And he came up to me after a panel and he said, I have armed groups using artisanal gold mining to secure the support of communities and bring them over to their side into this conflict. What do I do? Who can I actually go and talk to? And so I said, well, I think you need to go and talk to CSRM. Because 
so, which is exactly what I said and is specifically true. And there's actually uh, a young woman who's doing her PhD on armed conflict communities and mining at CSRM now. That's Deanna, who hopefully is in the audience some, somewhere here. But I think that that makes, there she is in the back. Um, I think that makes the point that CSRM is truly the global leader for all issues writ large related to mining. I look to CSRM for critical thinking, for new ideas, for ways to think more strategically and more deeply about socio-political complexity and ways that we as an industry and particularly Oceana Gold as a company can improve. Um, I've known Tony Kelly and Deanna here for many years. They are my mentors and they are also my critics. And I really appreciate the way that CSRM can sit down with industry and really push us to think better and more profoundly and more responsibly about how the work that we're doing is impacting communities and governments. So I'm sure that we will have a great discussion today with the panel, and I really look forward to the expertise that um, everyone's going to bring. I hope the lunch is good. You can talk to me afterwards if it's not, but thank you very much for coming today. Thank you, Sharon. And um, I would now like to hand over to Professor Deanna Kim, uh, Director for CSRM, um, who will be facilitating the panel discussion on mining and social sciences. All right. Well, thank you, Neville, for your opening remarks um, and for Sharon for your support for the session today. Uh, and to Oceana Gold for lunch, which will be served on the terrace just behind us, uh, just before 12.30 p.m. Today I'm joined by colleagues from the Centre for Social Responsibility in Mining, social scientists of all persuasions, anthropologists, sociologists, social geographers, de development specialists, amongst others. We're also joined by Emeritus Professor David Brereton, Hi, David. Um, who was the centre's inaugural director? So David was my PhD supervisor, um, and 15 years ago he was instrumental in building a foundation for the centre that we see today. I can see other colleagues uh, from across the SMI and from across UQ, and also some unfamiliar faces. So while this event is about strengthening established connections, it's also an opportunity for us to build new connections. So whether you're already a part of our vibrant network or you're new to CSRM, CSRM we really um, look forward to engaging with you in conversation with our panel and also over lunch afterwards. So a big welcome to everybody. And before introducing the panel, I would like to take just a few minutes to tell you a little bit about CSRM. I'd also like to briefly explain our expertise and how we've built it over the years and encourage you to connect with us. So what's our work about? Mining is an incredibly significant sector. Most things about mining are big, from the capital invested in projects to the tons of earth moved, the profits made and the taxes paid. The social and environmental impacts can also be significant. So given all of this, a key area of research for CSRM is around resource governance. As the mining industry continues to move into new frontiers, mines are more likely to be located in jurisdictions that face governance challenges. Jurisdictions where the responsible use of mineral wealth will be critical for achieving the sustainable development goals. CSRM researchers are directly involved in global initiatives such as the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, or the EITI, a platform that aims to increase public access to information about revenue collection, allocation and distribution. This is just one example of the types of multi-stakeholder initiatives that we're actively researching and engaging with to influence how the sector is governed. And while we have researchers focused on global schemes, we have others who are more focused on localised impacts. The effects that heavy footprint industrial mines have on local people and the places that they live and work. This is the arena that the industry refers to as social and environmental performance. 
These days, much of the industry subscribes to international standards that require developers to avoid harm to local people. These standards also require companies to ensure that where harm does occur, there are remedies available for affected people, particularly groups that are at risk or vulnerable. From our perspective, from a centre perspective, the industry has some way to go to demonstrate its social performance credentials. This is an arena where social scientists have so much to offer. We'd like to see more social scientists engaging these issues from different perspectives and working to improve outcomes for local communities. We know, for example, that the industry continues to underestimate or overlook social complexity in their operating contexts. And in our experience, even in the most seemingly benign of contexts, social complexities abound. CSRM staff work with mine affected communities around the world, collaborating with local people and research partners to understand the local context, collect and analyse social data, understand what has transpired on the ground or what might transpire on the ground, and explore the prospects for responsible resource development. And in doing so, we work to bring social perspectives on mining from the margins to the centre stage of debates about resource development. I thought it was also important to briefly say what the centre is not about. So we don't work with companies just to improve brand. Improved reputation may well be an outcome of a robust, relation, a robust research partnership, but our core focus is conducting research that seeks to avoid harm to communities, mitigate impacts and strengthen resource governance systems to support the equitable distribution of risk and benefit. We apply a set of criteria uh, to screen what work we say yes to, and this includes testing whether there's potential to improve social performance and resource governance. Whether we have sufficient control over the research process and the, and the outputs. Whether we're able to think independently and to produce knowledge for the public good. And whether there's sufficient community benefit to, uh, to warrant conducting the work. We think really carefully about the work that we do, what we take on, and whether it aligns with our principles and our criteria. So let me just tell you a little bit about our expertise and, and how we've built it. We have expertise in a range of areas, mostly where stakeholder demand has been strong. So for example, in social impact assessment, community engagement, conflict analysis, indigenous employment and agreement making, uh, and human rights and gender. These are areas where we now have a really strong track record. Over the years, we've also worked to develop expertise where demand was weak, but where we saw problems emerging. This is where we have invested our own research centres funds or applied for grants, strategic funds from UQ, foundation monies to support the work we really wanted to do. We did this in displacement and resettlement research, for example, and also in the arena of artisanal and small-scale mining that Sharon mentioned earlier. We're now in a stronger position to engage with governments, developers and communities on these really difficult issues. And we're still investing in other areas where we think there'll be demand for evidence-based expertise in the future. So three key areas that we're working in, the downside risks of new mining technologies and mine automation for local communities, social incident investigation, including how we can routinise the analysis of social incidents as happens in health and safety, and also the social aspects of mine closure. Mine closure is an increasingly topical issue, and at the SMI, we're in the process of, of establishing a research and practice consortium on this topic. And I can happily announce that Oceana Gold has agreed to join the consortium and has committed some untied funds for us to work on that topic um, over a period of three years with, with other, others as well. So finally, uh, I'd, I'd really like to encourage you to connect with us. Social scientists of all kinds are fundamentally interested in how communities function, the relationship between different groups of people, and the connection that different people have with the natural environment. Few other sectors offer the same opportunity to explore the rapidly changing interface between people and technology. The central role of land and territory in resource development and the ways that different actors make claims over places of interest. 
and also how different stakeholders are giving practical meaning to this idea of corporate responsibility. These are live issues that have enormous effect. New technologies are transforming the way we live and work. Indigenous peoples are asserting rights over land at a time when the market is increasingly hungry for what sits beneath the surface. And consumers are demanding greater transparency over production and handling of all types of commodities. The potential for social scientists to create change is enormous. So if you're from industry, we would encourage you to engage social scientists and to bring their diverse perspectives to the table and also to invest in collecting and analysing social data as rigorously as you would geological, financial and production data. If you're a potential PhD student out there, I would encourage you to think about mining as a field of applied social research and to consider studying with CSRM. If you're from another UQ faculty, consider collaborating with us. We've got access um, into one of the most significant sectors on the planet. We're prepared to think critically, to apply social theory and methods to the most contemporary of challenges. So if I haven't piqued your interest in studying, working or collaborating with us, hopefully the panel will. Um, and this is our, our panel. So I would ask the panel to, to move into their seats um, and I will introduce them all individually, uh, very briefly. Um, you've all got your smartphones as well, so I'm sure if you wanted uh, a little bit more information on, on any of their very impressive uh, profiles, you can, you can Google them for a little bit of additional detail um, as, I, as I introduce them. A reminder to turn your microphones on, panel. Okay. So first, let, and, and our phone's off as well. I just heard someone's being. <laughs> um, first, let me introduce and welcome uh, Dr. Sarah Holcomb. Sarah is a, a social anthropologist with more than 20 years of experience working in <coughs> Aboriginal Australia with land councils and research organisations. Previously, Sarah was with the Australian National University, and we're very lucky that she's now a senior research fellow with CSRM at UQ. She's an accomplished scholar. She was awarded a four-year ARC Future Fellowship grant, which she held from 2012 to 2016. And as an outcome of the fellowship, she's just published a book. Uh, we have flyers out the front if anyone would like to make a purchase. Um, Remote Freedoms, Politics, Personhood and Human Rights in Aboriginal Central Australia, uh, published with the prestigious Stanford University Press. So welcome, Sarah. Uh, next, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Anthony Kelly, uh, who I've known, I think, probably the longest of anyone in the room. But Tony brings more than 50 years of experience in community development work in Australia's Indigenous communities and globally. Tony's work is, is, um, is grounded in a deep commitment to the Gandhian tradition of people-centred development and to working with the poorest of the poor. I met Tony 20 years ago when I was working for BHP Billiton, and he was actually working here at UQ in the School of Social Work. Tony was part of an Oxfam group introducing senior mining executives to the idea of rights-based community development. And since that time, Tony has continued to engage with the mining industry in more than 20 countries and at many of the world's largest projects and operations. Tony has also just published a book, uh, you can buy that one as well, uh, with his colleague Peter Westerby. Um, it's titled Participatory Development Practice Using Traditional and Contemporary Frameworks. So welcome to Tony. I'd like to then introduce adjunct professor Anthony Hodge, which we also call Tony, so hopefully we won't get confused, but Anthony, Tony Hodge and Tony Kelly. Tony is an adjunct professor at the Mining Engineering Department at Queen's University in Canada. <laughs> I'll forget. Thanks, Tony. Um, and Tony's, Tony's on sabbatical with the SMI until December as a visiting professorial fellow. While Tony has worked in the private sector uh, with government, civil society organisations, including uh, environmental groups, uh, you were CEO of the Friends of the Earth for some years, Perhaps his highest profile role was as President and CEO of the International Council on Mining and Metals, 
uh, a position he, he held for seven years from 2008 to 2015. Tony is also very well published. He's not launching a book, uh, but he has just launched a masterclass series that's running here at UQ on mining and society in the 21st century. These seminars are exploring the technical, environmental and social issues influencing the mining and society relationship. So a big welcome to Tony. And finally, uh, Professor Anna Littleboy, uh, welcome. Anna's program lead of one of the SMI's new cross-cutting research programs called Transforming Mine Life Cycles. Anna has recently joined the SMI after a 15-year career at the CSIRO, where she led the $17 million a year Resources and Sustainability Program, integrating more than 80 multidisciplinary staff, including many social scientists, into industry-facing research projects. With a background in earth and environmental sciences, much of Anna's career has been spent facilitating connective conversations between researchers from vastly different disciplinary backgrounds. So a big welcome to Anna as well. Great, I don't have the clicker times doing that. Um, so everyone's, um, I've introduced CSRM, uh, everyone's been introduced. So we're going to move into um, the panel conversation. I'm going to uh, kick it off um, by asking each panellist uh, one question, just so you can hear a little bit more about their perspectives and their ideas, um, and then we'll open it up uh, to, the, to, the, to the audience for a, um, a more free-flowing discussion. <laughs> yep. Thanks. Okay. So, Tony Hodge, I'm going to start with you. Tony, before the panel, you and I talked about um, having an image to prompt conversation about mining and the social scientists uh, and the social sciences. Um, and this is the image that you chose that's, that's shown up here. Could you talk us through this image as a teaser so that people can follow up with you afterwards about some of the ideas that sit within this um, collage? Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Deanna. Thank you for inviting me here to University of Queensland, and uh, I very much appreciate this opportunity. And I have to tell you that the question that you posed to me utterly confused me. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know what to do with it. So I will come to the picture. Hold. So most of my working life has been focused on natural resource management, and in particular the relationship between mining and society, that interface. It's a troubled interface. It's troubled because of tensions involving society's need for minerals, metals, and construction materials. It's, it's troubled because of a tension between a corporate ethos that focuses on production, on efficiency, on profit, in contrast to community values that are demanding care and respect for people and the ecosystem that is around them, and participation in decisions that affect their own future. And it's troubled because there is a growing sense of unfairness in the distribution of costs and risks and benefits, a sense that responsibilities for seeing committed actions are not always clear and clearly assigned, and a sense that the needed systems of transparency and accountability are not in place and operating as needed. Now, addressing these issues is the stuff of CSRM and SMI. And if you look at the little global of Queen, University of Queensland creating change, oh, you don't have it up there. Well, it is up there. In any case, it doesn't matter. The problem is that addressing these, these issues is not possible through classical engineering solutions, even though the dominant people in natural resource activities, and mining in particular, are engineers and technical people. These are issues not of the head to resolve, these are issues of the heart and the spirit. 
And I must tell you, in, in working with young engineers at this stage, I often ask them, if you're in trouble in a class of engineers, if you're in trouble with your personal relationship with your girlfriend, do you turn to your colleague engineers for advice on that matter? <laughs> and the response is, is always exactly as what it was just then. And it's, it reflects the cultural divide. So bringing this state of affairs, bringing change to this state of affairs is what interests me. And it's a task that's far from trivial. And that's the task that Deanna, in her opening remarks, just laid out in ter as being the focus of CSRM. That's the task that's at the heart of what Neville described as being at the heart of the work of SMI. And that is the task that the mining industry is not recognizing that it has to address. There are some keys to bringing this change. One is that in thinking about solutions, it's not just the ideal intellectual framework or substantive solution, which is so much the bread and butter of the scientist and the engineer. It is the process of getting there, the relationships that you engender, that you cultivate to make possible the transition from here to there. And that means oftentimes finding an overlapping values, the common ground to work together. It means looking at the forest and not just being preoccupied by the trees. It means looking at the long term and not just the short term. I would argue that in engineering language, the kind of sustainable development commitment that Deanna articulate means moving to a new kind of two-dimensional design criteria that says that human activity should be designed and then tested against whether or not they are contributing to both human and ecological well-being over the long term. And this can be only done through profound collaboration between the technical sciences and the social sciences. And again, that is the bread and butter, that is the raison d'etre, the CSLRM and SMI. And I would argue, if you look at the Create Change logo of the University of Queensland, that's their raison d'etre as well. So we need to refresh our sense of the bridging between the social and technical sciences because it is the cultural divide that is in fact impeding process. That is where the most fertile ground is for insightful research and wisdom to take us forward in an innovative way. So the picture. <laughs> this picture captures the long term. It captures the complexity that we have to deal with. It captures the relationship from the heart of people to the land which is their home. That's why I chose that picture. Thank Thanks. you, Tony. There's so much to follow up on there. I, I know that um, Hopefully you're thinking about your questions that you can, you can ask the panellists as they speak. So thanks for kicking us off. Um, Sarah, I'd, I'd like to pose the next question to you. You're working across a number of fascinating projects at CSRM and one, top, one topic that you're starting to carve out is around mine, mine automation and Indigenous employment. And, and you, oh, the next slide please, John. Um, you recently released a consultation draft uh, of a report on, on this topic. It's out for consultation at the moment. Can you tell us a little bit about this work uh, and why you think it's important? Thanks, Jenna. Yes, I'd love to. Um, I might initially provide some context to this current project, though, on automation and Indigenous employment futures, in part to set up its significance. One of the first research projects I was engaged in as postdoctoral fellow from 2002 at the ANU focused on the relationships between the mining industry and Indigenous community organisations and whether regional sustainable development could emerge. It was a multi-sited project with one of the sites being the Pilbara region. At that time, about 10 to 15 years ago, this mining, in this mining region, 
only about 30% of Indigenous adults were engaged with the mainstream labour market. And this was mostly via the then Community Development Employment Program um, and government administration, and in government administration. Working with the mining sector was not that significant. Mm. So my research interests focused on what other opportunities, including livelihood and entrepreneurial opportunities, were possible within the limitations of the local community development agreements, which at that stage I was critical of as being like tied aid. My interest was on how Aboriginal people as beneficiaries of agreements could benefit from them, from them beyond direct employment. At that stage, my research found that many Aboriginal customary landowners who were the agreement beneficiaries had other priorities beyond working for industry, and my focus was on how these could be enabled. Likewise, at that time, it seemed to me that the work-ready or pre-employment programs that are also part of the local agreements were at a relatively early stage of development and had yet to bear fruit. <coughs> so here we are, about 15 years later, which is almost a generation. And the most recent census data from 2016 tells a different story. And it's the story that this census data begins to tell us that has been a key driver for this project. Indications are that for the first time in remote regions, the mining industry has become the largest employer of Indigenous men, exceeding the government sector for the first time. In fact, in Western Australia, iron ore mining was listed as almost 10% of the total employment by industry for Indigenous peoples, men and women. Interestingly, during the downturn, the mining sector didn't reduce the numbers of Indigenous employees, whereas the number of non-Indigenous employees fell into decline. And likewise, employment figures in Canada, uh, which has a similar Indigenous demographic profile in relation to unemployment rates in remote areas, also tells a similar story. According to the Minister for Natural Resources in Canada, the mining sector was the largest, I think, private sector employer of Indigenous Canadians last year. It's against these recent and unprecedented gains that we have the potential of mining's technological transformation as part of the fourth industrial revolution. A recent report on the near future of mining predicts that by 2020, robots will replace more than 50% of miners. Examples to suggest that this may not be far off are not hard to find. They include Rio Tinto's long distance heavy haul driverless train in the Pilbara, the first in the world and also Rio Tinto's new mine in Maidu country in northwest Western Australia, which they claim, actually it's northeast, northeast Western Australia, which they claim will be the world's first intelligent mine. Likewise, in Queensland, BHP Central Queensland coal mines are operated through IROX, or Integrated Remote Operation Centres, based here in Brisbane. The mining industry's narrative is overwhelmingly positive about the potential of the new technologies to reduce labour and operating costs, improve safety, and also be less greenhouse gas intensive. Automation, they say, will be a game changer. Yet these same companies are largely silent on the downside risk to local employees and communities. Typically in the mining sector, drilling, blasting, and train and truck driving um, constitute over 70% of mining employment. Automation is said to target these jobs as the most routine and entry level. Our preliminary research indicates that these are also the jobs that are held predominantly by Indigenous peoples who are often engaging, who are often engaging the market economy for the first time. The predicted acceleration in mine automation, this digital disruption, could disrupt this employment trend. However, to date, there's been no consideration of the potential impacts of automation on this growing Indigenous workforce. Yet training, employment and regional procurement targets are now a standard element of local level agreements, and in fact a standard element of a whole host of policies and global standards that companies are signed up to these days. In the paper up here, we raise a host of questions about the vulnerabilities of this Indigenous employment cohort what will be the alternative value proposition when local training and employment opportunities are no longer available? Though the core research question we raise, and the one that I'll leave you with is, that we need to understand the scale of the risk and the nature of the potential impact to begin to have discussions around this. And I think that's about my four minutes. Thank you.
Thank you, Sarah. I know it's a topic that you're really uh, passionate about, so it's great to have that all laid out. Um, we're looking for research funding. It's very important research, and we'd love to be digging into it, so, you know, that's our plug. Um, it's also a topic that, um, I mean, David, you know, you've done so much work um, over the years with many others in the room from CSRM on the issue of Indigenous employment, and new questions are being raised around that question with the advent of new technology, so it is something that we really want to look at carefully. But, so thank you, Sarah. Okay, so Tyne, you've got the clicker on this one. But Tony, Kelly, um, you and I did a podcast for CSRM about five years ago, um, and one of the questions I asked you was whether the industry's senior leaders were, were tuned in to the need to have careful dialogue with mine-affected communities. And this is what you said, as long as the tech works. What the current reality is, is that, um, and it's not really only associated with the mining industry too, if there's no noise, it's all right. Mm, mm, mm. So communities basically have to throw rocks on railway lines and create noise and protest to be heard, to be heard mm. and to be listened to. Mm. And some companies have even got the system of of green, orange and red light yeah. and it doesn't even get to management's yeah. attention unless there's a red light, yeah. which of course means that it's too late. Mm. Uh, so that whole area of, of uh, being able to understand the nature of the relationship between the company and the community is, is I think, one of the, the most important challenges. So apologies for finishing your sentences and for the arming and arming. That was the first one. I, that, that was the first one I ever did. But I, I just, when I re-listened to that over the weekend, trying to find something that I could put into dialogue, because that's Tony's, um, you know, key platform from which he teaches. Um, that was the that was the segment that I that I chose. But Tony, the question is, you know, five years on, um, has the reality changed? What are you seeing out there? What should we be thinking about and looking at? Uh, in terms of mine community dialogue? Oh, you've given me a very good question there, Diana. <laughs> yeah, the green, amber and red light warning system was really popular with some companies and it suited some managers with, particularly with engineering backgrounds, but it also had some fit in the industry with uh, safety policies of the of the companies, but it was uh, far too mechanistic to describe the mischief and the complexity of the relationship between communities and companies. I hope, uh, in answer to your question, Diana, that uh, I'm fairly confident in being able to say things have improved. So I think I've got good news there. One of the issues that uh, certainly has improved the situation is the establishment of formal dialogue training programs for community relations staff in many companies across many countries, both on-site in the domain of the companies and the communities themselves, but also on site in universities like uh, here at UQ and, for example, at the Catholic University in Chile. I think essentially the training has helped both staff and management to understand a very important difference, and that difference I'd like to share with you. The difference in three social science contributions to the mining industry, the first one, and the most familiar to the mining industry itself, is the public relations role. And usually those people who have been appointed to public relations roles have come with 
usually journalistic backgrounds, usually with very good connections to the press and to media and very good knowledge of uh, those mediums. The traditional role, though, of the public relations officer has been to defend the company, to promote the company, to promote the interests of the company. And I, for one, don't want that job to go away. They're very, very helpful people. What, though, is very different is a community relations job. It's much more out there, not in headquarters, in the community itself, and it is essentially about building good relationships with the community. And good community relations people need to be understood by the community. Many is the time I have been told Tony, we didn't have any community problems until you came along. <laughs> <laughs> so the story of being able to hear both the good news and the bad from the outside is critical. The third role, and there are a few companies now engaging in this, is a community development appointment. And they do this in a variety of ways, sometimes through foundations, which I have got questions about, sometimes through partnering with NGOs in the area, and sometimes by doing the work themselves. But a community development role is actually a purposeful attempt at the upliftment, inclusion of the poorest of the people because usually the money, the expertise, the requirements of people in the community, particularly the poorest, mean they don't benefit at all from, in fact, the cost of their food goes up and so on. Uh, they're very often much worse off rather than better off. It's now, in my view, absolutely essential that key people on staff have professional training in dialogue. Now, I want to talk just for a half a minute left to me on what we professionally mean by dialogue. Dialogue is not conflict resolution. Dialogue is not mediation or arbitration. They're all very important methodologies that usually a person trained in dialogue understands, but they are not dialogue. Dialogue is the professional skill associated with dealing with extremely difficult topics, and even though that topic may not be resolved, or may be resolved by one party in favour of another party. Dialogue is the process that maintains the relationship through those difficulties. Now, this is extraordinarily important for the mining industry because whether the court decides this or that, or in the case of some instances that we're dealing with, the armed conflict is resolved one way or the other. The parties still remain neighbours. And being able to establish and hold on to relationships through these fraught circumstances is essentially the gift of dialogue. And that's what the training over the last several years has been about. Thank you, Tony. And I think many of us here have, have also been uh, taught by Tony as well, so it's, it's good to hear that um, again. Okay. 
finally, Anna, before we open it up to, to audience. Anna, here at the SMI, um, you're leading a cross-cutting program called Transforming Mine Life Cycles. And one of the issues that you're focusing on is mine closure. How will the social sciences feature in the SMI's work on mine closure going forward? So I've got a picture of a mine to talk to. This is Joe Mine, my stock image. Yep, no. my stock. And, um, <coughs> And what I'm actually thinking of doing is I actually want to tell you a bit of a tale of how the social sciences have influenced the development of a mine to a stage where it is ready to close. So I'm going to be talking about what leads up to closure because at the end of the day it's what happens before closure that fundamentally drives how you close a mine and what you want to achieve by closing a mine and thinking beyond closure about succession and what's going to happen in that place and time once a mine, mine has been and gone. So we talked a bit already about what, why do mines open and um, it, you know, there is a societal need for more metals. I make that as an assertion. I can substantiate it if you want and much of the work that's done in places like the UQ Energy Initiative is looking at the um, deficit that we have in some of the metals that we need in order to really make progress against the UN Sustainable Development Goals. But we also know, as Tony has said very eloquently, that we can't mine the way we have mined before. So what we're seeing is we, we know of existing copper deposits. Copper is a critical metal to help us meet some of the targets set for decarbonisation in the Paris Agreement. We know we've got lots of it around the world, but many of these deposits we're not accessing now, not because the market conditions aren't right, but because there are social and legal challenges that relate to things like water availability, tensions around environmental concerns. Uh, so what we're seeing is this fundamental dichotomy between a, a a large-scale societal need and the consequences of meeting that need which are experienced by a much smaller group. And I would contest that only the social sciences with the, I guess, the ability to respect different value systems and the plurality of different ways of thinking about what's important, with their ability to acknowledge, incorporate subjectivity in the way you think about how things are working and with their ability to critically evaluate the rules and norms that we're all operating under. That's the only discipline that actually gives us a whole load of skills to really try and make sense of this conundrum and work out who owes what to whom when you're delivering something for a large collective but the impact is happening on a much smaller collective. So we open mines, and I guess um, in order for a mine to open, there has to be a resource in the ground at that location, which is defined by geology generally. And there also have to be uh, favourable conditions, and those conditions are set by uh, resource policy. They're set by... Um, whether or not um, the currency rates are favourable. They're set by a whole load of institutions, both at a global level and at a national level, that determine whether or not there is sufficient stability for major investment to go in and a mine to, to develop. Now, that, to me, is where political science and institutional theory and currency markets all begin to have an influence on whether or not there are favourable conditions to open a mine. One of the unique things about a mine is that you go where the resources are. You can't just move down the road if the neighbour doesn't like it. And, and this um, it fundamentally is something that influences where a mine fits. And so for people who happen to have lived potentially for hundreds of thousands of years, where there are resources, all of a sudden, something's happening to them, not because of anything they've done, but because of something that is fixed under the ground. 
And in order to, you know, sort of really help manage that transition, we have a whole plethora of planning processes and approvals processes and regulatory processes that are set up. And, and generally, mines are planned to return investment back to shareholders in as short a time as possible. And then we have regulatory and um, regulatory systems and also non-regulatory kind of frameworks that come in to protect you know, human rights, to protect environmental uh, concerns and everything. So again, here you've got legal frameworks coming in, you've got an understanding of how policy is set, you've got how different people interact with each other. I'm not even directly on the mind yet, I'm still talking about the national systems that determine whether or not a mine can proceed and how it's going to proceed. And it raises questions such as who gets to determine what the goal of a mine is? Why them? Why not someone else? How representative is that? What power comes in in those decision-making systems and how can that power be abused? So it begins to introduce all these questions that the social sciences are much better placed to consider than, than the engineer. And I really like your analogy of who would you ask for help in your marriage. Um, okay. And then finally, let's say the mine is opened. A number of things. So because the mine is fixed in space, it becomes part of the culture and the heritage of the place in which it becomes part of the identity of, of the place. It fundamentally changes the social groupings. It, it disrupts often num millions of years of development and it shapes the trajectory of the identity of the place. So social anthropologists, geographers, people who understand history and culture are all people who can help us understand the nature of that, that transition. You know, a huge disruptive event in the grand scheme of things comes in and changes everything about a place for a number of decades and then it just goes away. There's something really fundamental about that, I think, that if you think about the history of a place, that's actually an enormous disruption. And the social sciences help us think about what does that mean? What does that impact really mean in the long term and the short term? And how do we manage it to best effect for the people in the place who've experienced this disruption? Now often, I know I've got to finish up now, I want to just come back onto often we discuss jobs and employment as something that comes as a benefit to the local community when you open a mine. Um, Sarah has raised some of the issues and concerns as technology enables mining to change and perhaps not require quite so much uh, on-ground people. The discussion about the relative roles of large-scale mining versus smaller-scale mining is shifting at the moment. In it, originally, I, I had a sense when I started in the industry, artisanal scale mining slightly informal, maybe a bit unsafe, it's somehow poor practice. Large-scale mining, that's great. We can get people out of, you know, unsafe places and everything. We can work to good practice and everything. It's fantastic. I think now, as automation comes in and erodes the benefit argument of employment, we're returning now to the idea of maybe smaller-scale mining done well actually offers the potential for livelihoods and employment where, where people can perhaps have smaller, nimbler, individual enterprises um, and not be employed by a large monolithic company or large monolithic corporation. So I think there's something changing there in the 21st century. So I haven't talked about closure at all, okay. really. That's okay. I but think that's okay. <laughs> I think people have got, people will have questions and we can, and we can follow up on it. But that's a great, I think, a provocation to... To, to finish on as well is that, you know, that what you described at the end there was a completely different proposition for mining. So I think we, we'll, we can leave it there and people can follow up with questions on, on closure as well. But thank you. <laughs> um, now it's time for, for audience Q&A and we do have a good amount of time. We've got 25 minutes or so. 
Um, I've got three process suggestions. We've got two roving microphones, uh, one there and, and, and Emilka. So Emilka and Nick have got the microphones. Pop your hand up if you would like to ask a question. Uh, and we'll get a microphone to you so everyone else can hear your question. Um, say your name if you can and if you're comfortable where you're from. Um, and the, the last suggestion is the aim of today is just to exchange ideas. If you've got strong views and opposing views, that's completely fine. We'd love to be able to be in conversation with you about them. We just ask you to frame it so the panel can respond, um, respond to you in, in, in conversation. Um, but I have got a reserve on the first question, so if we could get the mic um, to, to Janice, uh, Janice Moriarty. So I promised the first question to Janice. Um, she has joined us from Emerald, so she's travelled for the session uh, from the Bowen Basin. Janice has been uh, a member of, the of, a, of a community, in a mine affected community. She's worked in local government uh, on mining issues. And uh, she's also now studying her PhD. So um, she's engaging in mining and the social sciences in many, many different ways. Um, so we'll ask you to kick us off, Janice, with a question. Um, and then just kind of put your hand up. I'll direct traffic a little bit. You can ask a specific member of the panel, or you can just ask the panel to respond. Um, I might direct traffic a little bit, but you're all mic'd at the same time, which means you can also talk over each other if you wish, <laughs> which would be fun as well. So, so, so please feel free to, to just kind of speak up and respond as people, as people ask questions. Thank you, Janice. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you to, um, to the centre and Diana for actually doing this event as well. Um, my first question really is open to all of the panel. And um, most people who know me realise that I usually ask the big picture questions first. So I'm sure there's other people here who are going to ask the um, more detailed questions. Um, but just listening to you all here today, there's obviously, um, you're advocating obviously for more social science um, and social research um, in extractive and resource regions. So, um, and I know that you're all working at the forefront of a lot of that research. However, my question is, what do you see are the, glare, the, the, the big gaps um, in current and future social science research for extractive communities and doing um, community development in those regions. Thank you, Janice. Um, hmm. I'm looking for non-verbals, that's okay. Tony's pondering. Sarah, would you like to, I mean, hmm. I know we've spoken about some of the gaps um, in terms of where we'd like to be working, what's not, um, where the light's not being shone, the type of issues that we'd really like to get to that we're not quite getting to. Um, Tony Kelly, I know that you've probably got views about that as well. So, um, and Tony Hodges, you're just thinking that through and is writing. But Sarah, can I can I throw to you first, just to, just to kick us off? Um, so, what are the current and future gaps in terms of social research in mining? Well, I've been also working on the social impacts of mine closure um, project, and we've done a bit of a literature review, um, which is online about that. And I guess one of the glaring gaps there is that there's very little literature and one of the re in, in relation to the social impacts of mine closure. And one of the reasons for that, of course, is that mines very rarely close. And the reason they very rarely close is that they're putting care and maintenance, um, relinquishing a mine takes a lot of money um, and is a very hard thing to do for a range of um, policy and regulatory reasons. But there's often a very um, proactive set of mechanisms that mining companies engage with to avoid closure and that's because they want to avoid a lot of those, having to confront a lot of those impacts. And I guess part of, you know, part of this sort of research, I mean that, that was an outcome, realising that mines just don't close and that might be one of the reasons there's very little social research in that space. But part of the issue also is that um, because of this very fact that mines are in certain places um, for, for no, you know, it's just a, a geological deposit is there and then a mine has to be put into that place. It is what it is. But there's a very secondary sort of consideration of those who are originally living there. 
mm. whether they're pastoralists, whether they're Indigenous peoples with, you know, thousands of years of connection. It's always a secondary thought, this idea that there's going to be social impacts. It's always the, you know, that the market economy always takes centre stage. And I think because of, you know, the the GFC, global financial crisis that happened, you know, five or ten years ago now, when was it, 2007 or something? 2000, anyway. Uh, th there's, there's now an understanding, an increasing understanding that this um, neoliberal sort of market that has overtaken the globe is not a sustainable market and that humans and their relationship to the environment is becoming more a more intrinsic way to understand our finite resources. We have one planet, it's very finite, and, and you know, reusing, um, upscaling, recycling, all these sorts of things have to take place. And I think you, know, you need human ingenuity to do that. And so I think always engaging the social and the complexity of the social up front. It's, it's, not, it's not an end of mind life. It has to be deeply integrated. And I think, you know, I, I won't talk for too much longer, but, but I think there's not just one gap, is, is kind of what I'd say. I, I see everywhere I look, I see gaps. Um, and even in, across institutions, the, the pocket of social scientists is small mm. when it comes, you know, to talking about these large-scale issues of, of mining because they have such significant impacts. The, the, the place may be small, but the impacts are huge. Um, they may be less than 1% of the planet, but the impacts are so very substantial. And so I, I think bringing social science up to every conversation that's had is a really useful place to start. We just need to be a few more of us to go around. Sorry, well, well you know, gonna... but we, we need to engage yeah. other social scientists, yeah. though. I yeah. mean, yeah. you know, it's not something to be scared of working yeah. in this space, is what I'd say. Mm. <laughs> Tony Hodge, you've had a helicopter view of the industry. I mean, you've been working at the large scale end. Uh, but working with all of the, the companies who've made a principled commitment to social performance. Could you give us a little bit of insight into maybe some of those ideas that you weren't able to, to convince companies that this is an important area, you know, to be working on a bit of a sense of maybe what gaps, um, well, you know, I'm going to deal with one gap, then I'm going to, I'm going to go up to the helicopter level too, because this is an area for, that I will explain which is fertile for social science research. A huge impediment to change in the industry is that there is a rump of very good companies doing it really innovative stuff. And there is a bunch of companies that are very reticent to do the same thing and perform in the same way. And they are actually holding back and undermining the credibility that the really good companies should be getting. Why is it that it has been so difficult for change to reach right across the industry? That's a social science question. That's not an engineering question. But we would have to get inside the fence. Whoever did that would have to get inside the fence. And the industry would be, have to be prepared to open their, themselves up into that question. And that's the sort of thing I think that could be tremendously helpful in enhancing the rate of change in the introduction of some of the practices that the very good companies are realizing are just now common sense, mm. but not being used by the laggards in the industry. Mm. Any other comments from the other panelists on this one, or should we take another question? I, I'd like to make a comment Great. if I can. Thank you, Anna. Well, it was just, the, the statement was made, you know, about the small number of social scientists working in this space, and I agree with that. And I agree with everything, particularly Sarah was saying, around automation and closure. But one of the other things that we haven't discussed is I often feel that mining and minerals is absent in some of the very high-level, top-level debates about the future of society. The, I remember the number of times people talked to me about the mineral water, the, the water food energy nexus. Mm. And, you know, you say, yeah, but what about minerals? And it's kind of, oh, yeah, go get back in your box, Anna, and everything. So I think there are socials, there are more social scientists than we give ourselves credit for who are working on problems and issues that are fundamentally relevant to the, setting the rules under which the industry operates. And, and what would be great is if we could find a bridge to those kind of people and get minerals more obvious in some of these high-level debates about how we choose to live as a society. Mm. Thank you. 
Okay, I saw Andy, and that's going to be our whole time gone, I think. But um, I'll try and work through this way um, for people who just had their hand up. Andy, can you, you yeah, kick us um, off with th Thank you all. Uh, Andy Holding, work for Newcrest Mining in uh, Melbourne. Um, each, each one of you said things this morning that resonate with the work that we're doing in Newcrest at the moment. Um, I think the frame, the frame for it, though, as a practitioner, comes down to the dialogue that you were speaking about, Tony. Because in listening to what you're all saying, I'm trying to imagine the conversation in the village and the conversation with my boss and his executive. And I'd like to frame this in terms of the fourth bullet point if I could, because in trying to report up, nobody wants more than three bullet points. They just want, you know, succinct. And I was dwelling on what you were saying, Tony, about, you know, there wasn't a problem until you came along. Um, and parallel to that, your, your comment about the traffic lights, which of course run, you know, not coincidentally with three traffic lights, three bullet points, you know, the whole thing has to be simplified. And we're very comfortable with the language of community, society, technical, and that's how reports are given. But to break, to break through the notion of community, which we're very comfortable with at the level of risk, everybody likes listening to that. I know that you've worked at a household level, which in a way challenges the three bullet points because it's begging questions of those neat, comfortable words that we use. And I just wondered if you could say something about what's being done at the household level and then how, the second part of that question is, how do you then get that heard? Higher up, how does it become a third bullet point, not a fourth bullet point? Uh, maybe if I tell a little story, uh, it, it might help. Uh, there was a land issue, and the company needed uh, a greater expanse of land. And the issue associated with that, that the particular traditional owner of the land was proving to be very difficult. And this meant huge difficulties for the company. When we sat down in a dialogue process with a, a, literally I've got 100,000 examples of this story, it turned out that she was quite happy to transfer the land, but that she had handicapped children and that was actually the issue at hand. The company was so far away from the reality <laughs> with which they were dealing. They were full of lawyers' opinions, of auditors' opinions, of politicians' opinions, <laughs> everybody's opinions except the opinion that counted, which is this lovely old woman concerned for her elderly, handicapped children. That's what needed to be addressed. So what we call text in dialogue is not commentary. It's exactly the same process as a court of law. Did you see the person? What did they say? And the moment trained people in dialogue can get text and not commentary, <laughs> it makes a profound difference to the decision-making process. So just give me a brief moment in the lift going up, that's all I need, <laughs> if they're trained, mm -hmm. if they're trained in dialogue, because you give text, mm -hmm. not, oh, they're difficult, oh, we've got a serious problem here, you know. So that's the, that's the issue. You need text from all the different levels. You need text from the people, you need text from the leaders, you need text from the politician, not commentary, commentary, commentary. So you're listening and hearing, not telling. That's right. Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah. And there's to, a whole chapter in the, the book. <laughs> you cover this in the book as well, right, Tony? The that? book... <laughs> The book basically, the training that we did is one chapter of that book. It's a four-day training course in, in dialogue and it's what we call micro-method. Then there's what we call meso-method, is how do you get the group to work? And then macro-method, how do you get dialogue into your organisation? 
So there's different levels. So that's a full course. But what we concentrated on in the dialogue was uh, micro methods, the dialogue, the dialogue process. Great. Thanks, Andy, for the question. Yes. Can you say, yeah, microphone over here. Thank you. Hi, Andrea Canaris. I'm from Umwelt. Um, we're a social environmental consultant. I'm also a um, alumni from UQ Social Science School, so it's nice to be here today. Um, my question is kind of a bit twofold. So um, I think you've alluded to the complexities and, and the varying rates in which these companies in, are willing to engage, some successfully, some very reluctant, not at all. Um, my observation has been that, my observation, my experience has been that having worked in a regulatory body that governments, uh, governments, when they ask or insist on companies to do things and hold them to account, we see that we get a lot better uptake and I think the environmental um, sciences is a perfect example that over the years um, that legislative framework that then gets applied and the monitoring that goes on, we've seen a big shift in the way in which these companies now embrace their, their requirements and adhering to that. The social sciences, in my view, is, is, is behind, but the current legislation has certainly, um, the social impact assessment that's now a statutory document, um, does allude to the fact that social science practice needs to be included in the SIA. Do you feel that um, there perhaps needs to be a next step? Uh, not unlike you see in the environmental, you wouldn't have uh, and you know you'd have an engineering doing the engineering work, have an environmental scientist doing the, an ecologist. Should we be expecting and advocating for social sciences um, being a requirement for the delivery of social impact assessments and therefore the understanding of the issues? Mm. Would that assist these companies? Yep. Mm. Thanks, Andrea, for for your Sarah. Well, well my understanding is that. Um, when you do do an SIA or an uh, environmental social impact assessment, you do need, um, it has to be independent from the company. There has to be some sort of proof of that. So it's obviously not company execs doing it. And also you have to prove to some extent, because I'm involved in a process in the Northern Territory, um, in not permitting exactly, but there's quite a strict criteria, I understood, that the person has to have expertise in that field. So I thought there was already that requirement there. But, Maybe it depends on which jurisdiction you're talking about. Uh, I think jurisdiction definitely does vary, and when you look at the SIAs, they are conducted from everyone from a communication engagement person, which may be from a public relations background, mm. right through to someone who may be a social scientist. It's very and perhaps it's loose. Perhaps it actually is loose. It's not as if the government says, where are your qualifications? Okay, that's an interesting... Tony, did you pop your hand up then? Tony Hodge? Yeah. I just want to offer a cautionary note because the kind of relationship championing that, that Tony, you have just talked about, which in my view has application not only at the, well, you, you said it yourself, there are layers of the onion and inside the organization is a serious and major challenges between company and, and so forth. The, the cautionary note is that in my experience, some of the most profound listeners and people sensitive to the issues that we're talking about here that generally are the purview of the social sciences, some of the most profoundly effective people that I've interacted with on that front are engineers. And similarly, I have met social scientists who are the most narrow-minded, unwilling to move, um, impediments to progress that, that you can possibly imagine. So an engineer in his or her training is going to be given a legal responsibility that's going to lead to a certain liability related, for example, to stamping a drawing or the stability of a tailings dam or the, um, the ability of a bridge to stand up or, or whatever. There's a there's a legal requirement for that, um, that society expects that engineer to fulfill. Um, I'm not sure exactly the same analogy lies on the social side. It does in reality in some senses, but I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to bridge that. And I would not want to prevent 
the people who do have these social skills from participating fully in doing what's needed to be done, which in the end it's the result that is most important. So I'm, I'm cautious about that. You can't legislate a team that says you have to have someone that's a graduate from anthropology in UQ. Have you still got the mic, Andrew? Yeah, it's a cautionary it note. Yeah, I don't see through it. Why are you talking about a discrete, a discrete component, which would be the EIS process, which mm. is the agreements process, um, not in all of the mm. broader social yeah. impact assessment and work that would happen. Mm. Of course, you can exclude them. One would hope you're working across uh, them. <coughs> this is, well, I guess what my method is that you have the expert, as we're saying, mm. the social sciences are those that understand um, the social context and the analysis And, and you are right in that there's a whole raft of consultancy companies, big consultancy companies, and in terms well, of you know, one of them. And, and they've often got sure, and, and they've often got a whole um, a whole range of experience here. You know, they've chalked up heaps of ESIAs and all the rest of it, social impact assessments, and but the qualifications of those individuals and also what they bring with them in terms of theoretical framing. Are they going to take a human rights-based approach to this local impact assessment? You know, what sort of theoretical, you know, expertise will they bring with them? Is it just ticking the box, permitting processes? That's right. And how ethical are they? And that is, I agree, quite random. And I can say that from experience working <laughs> with a group. Yeah. yeah. So we, we refuse to work on a particular project in the NT and, and other groups working with them. And I'm, I'm working with that group, but it would be interesting to see how it unfolds. Mm. I mean, one of the things that, and, and you are an alum, alumni of the uni, but um, the professionalisation of, of community relations work and having a formal set of qualifications so that you create a bit of supply side as well, while the regulations creating the demand side, that things might move a little bit closer together so that at least there's clarity over the minimum levels of expertise in the social sciences and, and mixed teams and multidisciplinary teams, which, mm -hmm. Anna, is your, um, you know, your deep experience is perhaps what will, you know, enable a level of engagement. But there is a gap around, well, you know, what kind of social scientist, um, how do we know that they're, that they're well qualified? Mm -hmm. Are they accredited? There's no accreditation system. Um, are they professionalised? Well, they've got, you know, qualifications in specifically in natural resources. So there has been a bit of a move, and, and with the downturn, there's been a bit of a slide back in terms of um, enrolments. Um, but, but that is an interesting space to be asking about, and it's an important question. 